Good evening, my brothers and sisters. This is Mac, Pastor J. Mac, back with you. I'm so glad you're back again. Thank you for your support. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for following. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for trusting God in this season. I know it's been trying times, but I also know many of us have testimonies of God's saving grace. And so I thank God for each and every one of you. Tonight, we're continuing our Bible study with our post-resurrection narratives. We're talking about a very important person in the body of Christ who has a bad label, who has a bad rap. And some of you know what it's like to have a bad rap. But before we get into the word, I want us to have a moment of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you, God, for being a God who looks past our labels or how people define us. And you see greater within us. God, I thank you. For those moments in which we have wrestled, we've had doubt where you've made your power, your love, your grace, and your mercy clear. God, make yourself known in people's lives, even right now. God, we need you. We need to understand you better. We need to seek your face. And so, God, I pray tonight as those who are watching this Bible study who want to know more about you and what the word has to say about you, that we are strengthened and encouraged in our faith. Thank you, God, for the word of God. Thank you for Jesus Christ being our risen Savior. Amen. My brothers and sisters, in this time of post-resurrection narratives, last week we enjoyed the time together and even furthermore on Sunday. And today, tonight, we had, we're focusing on just one narrative. I know last time we looked at two. I know last time... We, we looked at the two men on the road of Emmaus and we looked at Mary Magdalene. Um, we'll continue chronologically and we're going to look at somebody who wasn't there when Jesus showed up to the 12 disciples. When Jesus didn't, when Jesus showed up in the room, it was one particular person who wasn't there, one individual who missed it. And we're going to learn some things about this gentleman on tonight. By now, some of you have already guessed who I'm talking about. Yes, it's Thomas. Some call him Doubting Thomas. Some call him Apostle Thomas. Some call him Saint Thomas. Whatever you call him, I hope his life and his story blesses you on tonight. We first come across uh, Thomas in, in the call narratives in which Jesus is calling the disciples. He's, his name is captured in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, are not where he's famous. In fact, there's one particular story that makes him famous, but I want us to journey and look at three other stories, uh, or two other stories to really show his character because you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge people based on one incident. You just can't. It's not fair. It's not fair. And sometimes even what we think we see in that one particular incident is it's, it's not what we think we see. So let's look at John. John chapter 11, as we talk about Thomas, when we first meet him, <clears throat> he's an inquisitive fellow. Um, in the account, of John chapter 11, for those of you familiar with the Lazarus narrative, the Lazarus pericope here, uh, Jesus has gotten word that his dear friend Lazarus is dying. But by this time, there are people that want to kill Jesus. There are people that want to take him out. There are people that want him to be finished, finito, done with. But Jesus, knowing what is waiting for him, if he goes back to a certain place or to a certain region, he goes and does it anyhow. It's a word for some of us that no matter what you face, do it anyhow. But Jesus, when he tells his disciples of where he's going, most of them are apprehensive. Most of them are like, nah, I'm good. Nah, I ain't trying to do that, Jesus. Nah. They trying to kill you. Don't you know where you're going? Don't you know what they trying to do? They got them hitters out for you, Jesus. Thomas says, let's go. Even if we die with him, let's go. I like Thomas. Everybody needs a Thomas in their life. Some people will call it ride or die. Some people call it your right hand man, best friend, sidekick, Robin to your Batman, whatever you call it. We all need people in your life that know that if something's about to happen, they got your back. We need people that will tell you when you're about to do wrong, that love you enough to say, hey, don't do that. Don't go there. But we also need people that are willing to go through the struggle with you. Some of you watching can think of times where so-called friends 
when you were at your lowest moment in life, they were nowhere to be found. When you had a new car, they wanted to ride with you. When you had new money or more money, they wanted to go out party with you. But when you were struggling, where were they? Thomas shows us that friendship is truly tested and shown in difficult times. Are you the type of friend that is there in difficult times? Proverbs tell us we should love at all times and a brother is born for adversity. And so you have to do some soul searching today. And I ask you, are you like Thomas? Thomas from the same place, Gal Galilee, where Jesus did much of his ministry, Thomas, he says, let's go. Let's go with God. And so he shows us that he's not afraid, that he doesn't lack courage, that he does not have timidity, but rather he's bold and daring. So then on another account, in John chapter 14, Thomas is listening to Jesus and Jesus is ministering to them. And Jesus is telling them prophetically what's about to happen about the crucifixion, resurrection. And he's talk, talking to them about comfort. And he, Jesus is saying to them in John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to, pre to prepare a place for you. And when I go, I receive you unto myself. Thomas, again. He steps out of the crowd. I like Thomas because he's different from everybody else. He could have just sat there like everybody else, but he was bold enough and courageous enough to ask questions. Asking questions does not mean a lack of faith. It is faith seeking understanding. Let me say that again. When you're asking questions, that does not mean you don't believe God. It doesn't necessarily mean you don't trust God. It's just that your faith seeks understanding. And sometimes we won't understand. That's why we often lift up the scripture. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. I get it. But sometimes, sometimes we ask questions. And so Thomas, out of the whole group, he's the only one that says, Lord, how will we know? I like Thomas. And I like Jesus's response. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thomas said, how will we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way. Isn't that good to know that when you're looking for direction, Jesus is the way. When you need guidance, Jesus is the way. When you need understanding, Jesus is the way. And isn't it good to know that God will answer your questions? God loves you enough and cares for you enough to respond to your anxieties, your worries, your doubts, your fears. God cares, God knows, God understands, and God responds. So don't live in this bubble and think that nobody's listening to you, nobody cares, nobody wants to hear you out, nobody wants to listen to you. God wants to listen to you, so talk to God. As the old song says, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. I like Thomas so far. He's batting two for two, but here's where it gets sticky. Here's where things get a little challenging. Here is where Thomas earned the name Doubting Thomas. So we move forward to John chapter 20. We dealt with it on Sunday where the disciples were in the room for the fear of the Jews. Jesus shows up and they are excited. They're witnessing. They're glorifying God. But by the time you get down to verse 24, they're telling Thomas about it. They're witnessing to Thomas like, hey, you got to see it. Jesus is back. He's risen. He's alive. Thomas like, nah, I'm good. I don't believe you. They're like, no, for real. He, he's alive. He is risen. He's risen indeed. Remember, he told us he was going to do all this stuff. Remember? And Thomas is like, nah, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and his side, I'm not going to believe it. Here, Thomas is apprehensive to believe. He refuses to believe. And before you go judging Thomas, before you start talking negatively about Thomas, I want you to think about those times in your life where you needed evidence, where you needed proof before you believe something. All of us at some point in life have had doubts. And some of it has been for good reason. You don't want to move without God saying so. You don't want to be outside of the will of God. You don't want to leave the favor of God. And so you wait. 
until God gives you a sign. Some people lift up Old Testament scriptures believing that God gives signs. We do believe in a God of signs, miracles, and wonders, but we don't put the Lord to the test. And so while we're not putting God to the test and having faith, we also don't want to be accused of being a complete doubter. At least be open to the move of God. At least be open to God doing something that most people can't believe. Believe in the supernatural. Understand this about God. God's power exceeds human understanding. God's grace and love exceeds human ability and understanding. And so just because you can't do it, do it doesn't mean God can't do it. So the, the challenge for us with Thomas is, is he wrong for doubting or is he showing us our natural selves? Is Thomas more like us in that he has a moment of weakness? Is Thomas more like us when he is showing us that occasionally even great people will have concerns and doubts? I find comfort in knowing that even the most wise person, the greatest person in the world can occasionally have a moment where you need proof have, and need evidence. That doesn't mean Thomas is not great. He's not pleased in the eyes of God. He, he He's not a child of God because believe it or not, Jesus still calls him blessed. Don't believe me. Continue reading on. Jesus says to him, Thomas, you believe because you have seen, but blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Here, Jesus is actually ministering to us. He says, you know what, Thomas? You needed evidence. I get it. You have been with me all this time. and You still needed proof. But for those who have not walked with me, those who have not sat beside me, watched me give sight to the blind, raise the dead, help the, the, the lame walk, those will be the blessed people. And so today... While you wrestle with your doubt, and, and I acknowledge it, and, and what, what my point today is that occasionally you will have doubts, but if you can get to a place in your life where you will believe even when you don't see it, God says you shall be blessed. When you get to a place in life where you're like, you know what, God, I don't understand what you're doing, but I trust you anyhow, that's when you'll be blessed. When you get to a place in life where you're like, God, okay, Lord, you got it. That's when you shall be blessed. Jesus speaks to Thomas and says, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Some of you watching today, you're believing God for something and you have no reason to believe it. You have no evidence, no proof, no validation, but you believe in God anyhow. So I want to encourage you. You just keep on trusting God. And here, what the Bible doesn't tell us is that after this encounter, Thomas goes on to do great things. Thomas goes to Babylon. Thomas goes to Persia. Th Thomas goes to India. And Thomas, possibly more than any other apostle other than Paul, he goes far and wide. He leaves beyond the Roman Empire and ministers to people. He, he was a great missionary. When we talk about the missional church and the missional movement, Thomas embodied that. Yes, Thomas was labeled as Doubting Thomas, but we see a couple things in here, uh, a couple life lessons that I want to leave you with from the experience of Doubting Thomas, Apostle Thomas, that may bless you. One, I want to say to you, it pays to be bold. It's good to have audacity. It's good to have courage. It's good to have faith. Thomas, as a disciple of Christ, had numerous accounts where he was the only one which means you don't have to always go with the crowd. You don't have to always do what everybody else does. Sometimes God wants you to speak up. Even when no one else will, God wants you to speak up. Number two, there's power in being present. It's a good thing to be in the number sometimes. Now, I just spoke about being bold and being away from the crowd in your audacity, but there also are blessings and benefits to being with the crowd. In this case, Thomas missed the blessing of being with the the disciples when Jesus showed up because he wasn't around. If Thomas had been there, we would have never had this encounter. I don't know if Thomas went to the store. I don't know if Thomas went to check on his family. The Bible does not privy us to why he wasn't there, but we do know he missed it. And likewise, some of you, you miss things in life because you're so individualized. 
You you miss things in life because you do your own thing. There is power and there is blessings in being present in the moment. And so I encourage you to be bold, but also be present. Be present with your family, especially during this time of crisis. Be present with your coworkers, your friends, your whoever it may be. Be present with your church family. Yes, I know we're doing virtual worship, but you can still gather together. This is not a time to go on vacation from God, but rather a time to be close-knit and together. Third, it's okay to ask God questions. Thomas asked Jesus in John 14, how will we know and how will we know the way? It's okay to ask questions. God actually invites your questions. You may not get the answer you were looking for, but trust me, God will answer your questions. Five, labels do not define you. Although many call him Doubting Thomas, they're not aware of the great things that he accomplished. Likewise, you may have a label in your life, drug addict, bankruptcy, the list goes on and on. I don't know what labels you have in your life, drunkard, alcoholic, angry person, bitter woman, uh, deadbeat man, whatever it may be. I don't know what labels you have had in your life, but you can live past the labels. And in fact, those people that are labeling you, they don't have the authority at the end of the day to determine who you are. Only God determines who you are. Only God can judge you. So don't worry about the label labels. You can live past the labels. Don't don't live in the prison of other people's opinions. But rather, you live your best life. Thomas, after being labeled Doubting Thomas, even though it doesn't say it in the Bible, it never says it in the Word of God, which shows me that God never called him Doubting Thomas. People did. And isn't it good to know that God looks at you differently from people? But here, even after in the early church where people started to call him Doubting Thomas, he lived past that. He had a greater legacy beyond that. And so for those that didn't even know about Thomas's legacy, I encourage you to read up on him. He's done some great things. And here, last but not least, life lesson number six, and I'm done. God sees greatness in you, even when others don't. God used Thomas to go far and near for believers to be baptized, for believers to, to learn about the word of God. He had a great teaching ministry. He is still known as the patron saint of India. And although there are many other belief systems or faith systems in, in India, Thomas brought Christianity there. God saw something in him to throw him and thrust him into those places. And maybe God is pushing you to a place of unfamiliarity. But God sees greatness in you even when other people don't. I want you to know today that you are great. God is great and God is within you. Therefore, there's greatness within you and therefore you have great purpose. So I want you to believe in God. Believe in yourself. This is Mac. I'm signing off. Continue to follow No Hope Like New Hope. Support us online as well as through your gifts. We thank you for your support. Many of you have been giving, supporting this ministry. We thank God for you. We love you with the love of Christ. Thanks. Tune in next week as we continue and we close out our last of our post-resurrection narratives. God bless.